But keep in mind, it had not rained for three years. There was no sign of water. And after everything you have just witnessed, Elijah commands him to go get some chow, and Ahab goes. And I just want you to think of the faith Elijah has in this moment. Elijah doesn't tell Ahab, God told me at some point in the future, he's going to send the rain. What does Elijah tell Ahab? He says, you need to go get some grub because I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Just, just think about what Elijah is saying. I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Elijah believes God's word so much that that is the only truth he recognizes. That's the only reality that he allows to influence his life. The rain is on its way. I, it, I understand it. I believe it so much. I can already hear it coming. Have you ever just been in that place where you're asking God for something or, or you're trusting in God and you just like feel it in your bones even before it happens? You're like, man, I just feel like this is going to come to pass. And then it does. And you're just like, oh, man, God, it's awesome. It like surprises you. You already knew it was going to happen, but when it happens, it still surprises you because God's amazing. I love those moments. I I've, have many of those moments to recount. Some are good situations, some are not so good situations. But every time God comes through, it's like, wow, this God that we serve. But Elijah is so in tune with God's word, so trusting that he can hear it even before the rain comes. So he doesn't say God is going to send the rain. He says the rain is already on its way. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17, Paul the Apostle is talking to the church of Rome, and he is recounting how God called Abraham. And this is what he says about Abraham's faith and how he was partnering with God. In verse 17, he says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So when God called Abraham, Abraham believed God. And here Paul is saying, and God is the type of God who will call things into existence even before they exist. God sees it before it happens. He knows it before it happens. He hears it before it happens. And when he speaks it, it happens. So you think about creation in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do it? He spoke and it was so. God said, let there be light and there was light. He saw it before he spoke it, but after he spoke it, it came to pass. He speaks things into existence, things that are not, and creates them, makes them into existence. And here, what God I is doing, just in creation, and Paul's affirming this is God's nature as creator, using speech, his word, to bring forth what does not exist into existence. Elijah, being a prophet of God, gets the awesome privilege to partner with God and releasing his words to call what is not into being. To literally say, this is what God said, I'm going to declare it and watch it happen. That is an amazing privilege. If you think about what, what Elijah is getting to participate in, in the nature of this prophetic gift and this prophetic privilege. But beloved, God has called all of us as children of God, as believers in Jesus Christ, to be hearers of the word and doers of the word. To not just hear God's word, but also declare God's word. To partner with him in this creative force to call things that are not as though they are. The words we speak are vitally important to the reality we create in our everyday lives. What you allow to flow from your mouth has a powerful force behind it to determine your reality. So not only is this an awesome privilege, but we also have an awesome responsibility to guard what we speak because what we speak also reveals what is in our hearts. If we're speaking doubt, guess what's filling our heart? Doubt. If we're speaking fear, guess what's filling our heart? fear. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is flowing out reveals what is happening in our hearts. 
And we need to pay attention to what we say. And the confessions our hearts make. Because as the people of God, just think about it. If you're a child of God, the spirit of almighty God lives in you. The spirit of the almighty God is empowering you. Is working with you. Is partnering with you. The gifts of the spirit work like a dance. He doesn't make us do it. We partner with him to accomplish it. So when we're walking in the spirit, when we are when we are declaring things in the Lord, when we are walking in faith, we have the innate ability, again, to shape our lives and the lives of those around us through the power of our speech. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says the tongue can bring death and life and those who love to talk will reap its consequences. We say a lot of stuff. But we will have to deal with the ramifications of what we speak. How we speak, what we declare. I, I, if you're uh, having an, an issue with somebody and you're calling them names, if you're saying, you're always this, you're always that, what are you doing? You are speaking and using the force of language to denigrate them. To put a power of discouragement and bondage on them. How many of you, when you were a little child, heard a criticism from a parent or somebody close to you that has marked you your entire life? The power of words. Especially the power of words on the lips of the children of God. For Elijah, releasing words was releasing seeds of faith. And his confession was simply, God said it. I believe it. There is no other truth. So when he spoke, he spoke what was in his heart. Faith that God's word was reality. See, we live in a world today where there's a lot of confusion. We live in a world today where everyone wants to make up their own reality, their own truth. Oh, what's true for you is not true for me. Or I can't define that for you because I'm not living your life. Only you can define that for you. But what you're defining, it's different from what they're defining it. So there's no real truth. It's all a figment of everybody's imagination. Not for Elijah. Elijah said what God says is true. What God says is true. That's what I'm going to believe. And when he speaks a word and I can or I declare that word, I understand I'm releasing seeds of faith. Seeds of faith that will germinate into produce the very thing God wants to produce. And in the Old Testament, it says God's word will never return void, but it will accomplish everything he sets out for it to accomplish. When we're declaring the word of the Lord, it will accomplish everything God has set out to accomplish. So what does Elijah say? He says, the rain is coming. I hear it even now. And that's how he talked about it. It's real to me. I feel it in my bones. So what does Ahab do? Does Ahab have a conversation or try to come up with the scientific reason as to why it wouldn't happen? No. Ahab goes to get something to eat because he saw God's hand on him on the top of the mountain when he sent the fire. He saw God working in his life. So Ahab leaves to go get some grub. And then Elijah goes back up the mountain where God sent the fire. One thing to note in ancient times, they had this perception of where the gods lived. You can look all through Mesopotamia and the ancient world and Babylon. And there's really two places that, that the gods dwell. They dwelled in gardens and on top of mountains. So if you think of like the Taj Mahal or some of the ancient places that have these ancient gardens that look just extravagant, why did they design them that way? They designed them for the gods. Luxury, peace, tranquility, no, no fear. They're walled in, so they're completely safe. But then also the mountaintops. Think of the Greek culture with the ancient Greeks. They lived on the, the Mount Olympus is where their gods were. And for the Babylonians, they had, they had their mountains and we know in Israel we have Mount Zion, the city of the living God. Well, God had just sent fire on top of Carmel in this contest. God claimed this mountain. He was king of this hill. When you're playing king of the hill, God is king of this one. Everyone else went packing. So Elijah, knowing that there's no sign of rain, 
what does Elijah do? He goes back to the place where he knows the presence of God can be found. Ahab, the rain's coming when there's no sign. I'm believing God. So how do I press into this promise? I'm going to go back to the place where God's presence can be found. We're going to go back to where I saw God move. I'm going to go back to the place where we worshiped the Lord. Remember last week, they had to rebuild this, the altar of God that had been torn down. He rebuilt the altar. He put the sacrifice on the altar. And when God sent the fire, he obliterated everything. So he's going back to the place where he just worshiped the Lord, back where he saw God move to a mountaintop where God's presence could be found. When we need God to make a move in our lives, and we're seeking him to fulfill the promises that he's made, sometimes we have to go back to the place of worship. We have to go back to that place where we saw God move. We have to get back into that place of intimacy where we were close to the Lord. And how do we do it? We do it just like Elijah did it. Went back to the place where he was worshiping the Lord and encountered God. You see, many of us, we, we get to these places, it's like a spiritual drought. There, there's a psalm that I think about a lot, and especially in times I feel distant from God. It says, God, this world is like a dry and dusty land where there is no water. And he longs to see the sanctuary of the Lord, to see his power and glory. Say, God, if you could just let me see your glory and power, it'd be okay, because I'm lost in this dry and dusty land. In Psalm 22, David is talking to the Lord. He's crying out, lamenting the same kind of feeling. He says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This is something Jesus himself quotes on the cross. That, that he's quoting this moment as David's writing in Psalm 22, just feeling completely disconnected from God. And David says, where are you? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you don't answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Have you ever been in that place where you're praying for something, where you're calling out to God, and it's like nothing. It's like my spiritual phone is disconnected. It happens all the time. We ebb and flow in our spiritual lives, and there are times where we're like, man, this is just on my heart, and you know, I'm praying for it, but God, I just don't feel like you're listening to me. You're not listening. I'm groaning. Do you see my pain? Do you see what I'm struggling with? Where are you? I thought you promised to never leave me or forsake me. Where are you? King David is, he's crying out. This is a, a psalm, and this is, if you think about Jesus, Jesus in his place, the, the state that he was in on the cross pulls from this verse because he's in agony, and what's worse than being in physical torment is being abandoned by Almighty God. Where are you? David is crying out to the Lord, but then he says something profound in verse 3. He says, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. God, there's no one like you, and you're enthroned on the praises of Israel. Another translation would say you inhabit the praises of your people. So what's he saying? The word enthroned, inhabit, means to dwell, to abide, to continue in. God, you abide in the praises of your people. You continue in the praises of your people. When your people worship you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, you sit down. Think of a, a, a throne room. Where's the king found? sitting on the throne. You are enthroned on the praises of your people. What's a king do on his throne? He presides over the court. He's working. He's giving wisdom. He's giving instruction. He's leading the nation. So David is saying, when your people are praising you, you take your seat and you preside over the people. You are enthroned. You inhabit the praises 
of your people. God loves to sit in that place of true, raw, authentic worship of his people and soak it up. The more we wholeheartedly seek the Lord, the more he abides or continues in that space. The more we pursue God in that place of intimacy and worship, the more we become aware of his presence because he is abiding in that place of worship. Does that make sense? I'm trying to emphasize it, and I'm using my pastorly emphasis voice to get this point across. Because believers struggle especially if you have come from a traditional background that's made you feel guilty for any kind of emotional expression when you worship the Lord, you will struggle with this point. But the Bible is telling us is if you feel distant from God, where God can be found is in the place of worship. Where did Elijah go to ask God to send the rain? He went back to the place where he knew God could be found, the place where he worshiped the Lord, and fire fell. Are you tracking with me? You see, some of us, no matter what you're dealing with, whether it's just doubting how much God loves you, doubting if God hears you, you're holding on to a promise you've not seen fulfilled, some of you need to go back home and get alone before God and worship him until your heart reconnects because he's not gone anywhere he's waiting on you to come back home the door to the throne room is open what's the writer of Hebrews tell us we can go boldly before the throne of grace but we have to go before the throne and how do we do that We do it as we pursue him in worship. We need to learn to sit in his presence and seek him. To not be so refined that your pride and your self-protecting mechanisms keep your heart from connecting to the Lord. Well, Pastor Joey, I might feel awkward or... It might be weird, or I've never done anything like that before, and I just don't think that's me. Let me encourage you. Take your dignity and put it on the altar and set it on fire. David said, I will become even more undignified than this because my worship is to the Lord. This is the heart that God is looking for. Jesus said, one day... True worshipers will arise who will worship in spirit and in truth. And many of us opt for the truth part because it requires nothing of us emotionally, nothing making us vulnerable. It's just concepts and equations. But there's the spirit part, the heart part that makes the truth part authentic. It's the part of us that actually can love God doesn't want empty praise. And without love, it's empty. It's just religion. So Elijah returns to the place of worship, and he takes his servant with him. 1 Kings 18, 42 through 43, says, So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed up to the top of Mount Carmel, bowed low to the ground, and prayed with his face between his knees. Just... Let your mind paint that picture. This is Elijah we're talking about. The man who just called fire down from heaven. But now he needs God to send the rain. And he doesn't approach God arrogantly and in pride, protecting himself, worrying about what other people are thinking when he's around when they're around. He brings his servant, and this man of God bows low to the ground and puts his face between his knees. That's a prostration of humility. I'm about to approach Almighty God, 
I'm not going to take this lightly. I'm not going to take it for granted. I'm going to give him the reverence he's due. Verse 43. He then said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went out and looked, and he returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. And seven times Elijah told him, now go and look. What I love is that Elijah is now instructing his servant the way God was instructing Elijah. Every command Elijah received from God was go, go, go. And now he's discipling the servant, and he's showing his servant how to believe God for impossible things. And so he prays, and he arises from his prayer, and he tells his disciple, now go look over the cliff's edge across the sea and tell me what you see. His servant comes back, and he says, nothing. Well, man, fire was a lot easier than this. I just asked one time, and before I was done, the fire was there, right? Like, what's, what's going on? This is where we get stuck. Think about Elijah's journey from this point. He went from the comfort zone, the safe zone, to the place of refining. And remember what happened in the place of refining? After God was feeding them supernaturally, the widow's boy dies. What's Elijah have to do to get the boy to come back to life? Do you remember how many times he has to pray for the boy? Three times. Three times. He stretches himself over the boy and cries out to the Lord three different times. God was training him already to understand sometimes walking in faith is real easy. It's simple. You feel safe. You have everything that you need. Sometimes it's going to be completely uncomfortable and very difficult. No matter what state you're in, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. No matter what state you're in, I am faithful, and I will do everything that I set out to do. So Elijah isn't phased by this. Now, in our life, think about what Elijah's getting ready to ask for. He's getting ready to ask for God to make it rain. In a land that hasn't rained in three years. The ground is dry, dusty, cracked. No crops are growing. People's animals are dying. They're starving to death because they can't feed their families. They're in a place of destitution. And if you were in Elijah's spot today, and you were to tell somebody, I'm going to go pray, and God's going to send the rain. That is a difficult pill to swallow. Because in our culture, we, we have... Many uh, atheistic scientists who don't believe that miracles exist at all, and anything that looks like a miracle is simply a scientific law we just haven't discovered yet. And these are the people that write our science books, inform our education, so from the time that we are young children, faith is being drained out of us. Trust in Almighty God for the impossible is being drained out of us. I mean, just go to a, a, a school place of work right now, and tell people that if I lay hands on a dead person, they could come back to life and see if they take you seriously. It's not happening. Because in our world, everything is bent on checking your faith at the door and having a naturalistic point of view. If you can't explain it with science, then it doesn't exist. So we have this difficulty with the way we've been raised, the culture we're in, to believe God for impossible things. Which is why even when we step out in faith to pray for each other for small things, like the common cold, we pray knowing God can, but we don't believe God will. Because we're raised to doubt. We need a financial breakthrough. We believe God can, but we don't think God will. I've been there. I was preaching to the choir. It was a few years ago. My wife and I, we were 
like week paycheck to paycheck. And we had, it seemed like more bills going out than we had money coming in. And we had a little bit of debt, a little bit of credit card debt, but we were making it, but it, we weren't comfortable. And so we started praying, God, you said if we tithe to you first, we give you first, you'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we can't contain. You'll take care of all of our needs. And God has been faithful, and he's met our bills. He's paid our way. But we still didn't feel like we could get out from underneath the pressure. And so we began praying for a financial breakthrough. God, I don't know how you're going to do it. You know, I don't play the lottery, so that's out. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I believe you will. And sometimes that was an easier prayer to pray than others. And it was about a year or so later, my grandfather passed away and left us an inheritance that more than paid for anything that we had and got us out of the mess. Did we know it or expect it? No. But God did it. Did it happen in a way that I would have liked? No. But it came through. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we could ask or think. And what God is trying to get his children to do in the day-to-day journey with him as we read his Bible and pray every day is to grow, grow, grow. Grow in what? In believing the truth of Scripture, letting that inform our reality, and living like we believe it. That his power can work through our lives in a powerful way. You see, I used to believe that Elijah prayed seven times, but that's not what the word says. It says Elijah prayed, and then he sent his servant seven times. So picture this. He's down on his knees. Okay, God, you sent me here to tell Ahab you're sending the rain. I did what you told me to do. Now it's on you. He stood up, said, go check. Came back. Servant said, nothing. He said, go check again. Go check again. Go check again. Go check again. And again. And finally, on the seventh time, he saw the cloud. I love this because of how confident he was in the Lord. The question I have is, what if Elijah hadn't sent him back to look the seventh time. And he'd be like us and say, well, maybe God's not ready. Oh, maybe it's not his will. I'll wait a little while, then I'll I'll ask him again. No. Elijah said, God said it. Now's the time. God's going to do it. He was so committed to what God had said. And I just believe that we fall short many times because we're not aware of what's happening in the spiritual world when we're praying and asking for things. Like Daniel prayed and asked the Lord for an interpretation to a troubling dream, and he had to wait almost 20 days or 21 days for the answer because there was a spiritual battle being waged, and the, an- the demonic angels were preventing God's angels from coming to give him the message. Like When you recognize who you are, you're a child of God, you're an ambassador of the kingdom, the enemy wants to stop communication between you and the Lord. He wants to stop God from answering your request because your request moved the kingdom forward, so he's going to get in the way to delay it. So we fall short. We, we're blind to what's happening in the spiritual world. We can't see it. We can't hear it. We, when we're praying for people for healing, we don't see the power go from one to the other. We don't, we don't see these things. It's all of faith. And we fall short because we forget that no matter what we see, we can trust the word of God. 1 Kings 18, 44 through 46, it says, Finally, the seventh time, the servant told him, I see a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And then Elijah shouted, Hurry to Ahab and tell him, Climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain is going to stop you. There's this little tiny cloud forming. He's like, oh, it's about to go down. God's about to send the thunder. As soon as the sky was black with clouds, 
A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt, and he ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. This is awesome. Elijah walks in faith, believes God, and God sends the rain. And not only does he send the rain, and that it's a downpour, but what's a result of Elijah's encounter with the Lord in this moment? He gets special strength. God turns Elijah into the flash. It's 31 miles to Jezreel from Mount Carmel. And he tucks his belt in and outruns King Ahab's chariot on foot. That's awesome. All right, we're going to rabbit trail a little bit. You got to go with me here, right? In the New Testament, it says when Jesus comes back, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. What did Jesus do? Walked on water, phased through walls, ascended into heaven, could raise the dead, he could multiply things. Like, there's some awesome things Jesus did. Calm the storm with word. You think Jesus had super speed and super strength like Samson? He's God Almighty. And the Bible says we're going to be just like him because we'll see him as he is in our glorified state. That's awesome. That's better than the Avengers. You can watch it or you can live it. I'm going to live it. And the Holy Spirit's been given to us as a foretaste of future glory. You can be entertained by Hollywood or you can live the exciting walk of the Holy Spirit in wielding the power of God to change hearts and lives. So awesome. This is why the Bible's awesome. This is why I love the Bible. And when you look at his life, you look at everything he did, you're probably thinking, man, that Elijah's a different breed. Like I would. Like I'm reading all this stuff and you're like, man, I wish I could be like Elijah. He's on another level. Some, man, something that I don't think I'll ever be able to reach. That kind of faith is uncommon. Like, do you know anybody like that? Do you know anybody that, that, that could do that, could stand like that, that believes like that? Well, James, who is an authority in this area, he's the brother of Jesus. Imagine growing up in that household. Can you for a minute? Jesus ain't getting blamed for anything ever. It's always your fault. Always your fault. Who left the toilet seat up? James. Not Jesus. Jesus is perfect. James would be an authority on feeling underwhelmed in the presence of greatness. In James 5, 17, verse 18, matter of fact, in the book of James, it's really funny. He talks about comparison an awful lot. He talks about not comparing people and, and not judging people and, and putting them in a lower place. I think he probably had a little pet peeve for that, feeling like maybe he was slighted some growing up. But in James 5, 17, he talks about Elijah. And he says, Elijah was what? As we are. Elijah's not special. He's not bigger than you, greater than you. He doesn't have more faith than you. Elijah is nothing more significant than you are. Yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, None fell for three and a half years. And then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Like, what do you mean Elijah's not different than me? I feel different than what I just read. But James is like, no, you don't understand. That wasn't Elijah's power. That was God's power. And God can do that in anyone. And he will do that through anyone who surrendered to him, who lives a life of worship. He's not a mutant. Elijah didn't fall in a vat of toxic waste to get his superpowers. None of the stuff we see on TV. And he's just a man. And why did James feel like he needed to tell us about Elijah? Because of what he says in the verses private and previous in verse 16. He says, confess your sins to each other and what, beloved? Pray for each other so you may be healed. Say this with me. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power 
and produces wonderful results. Don't you love this new screen? You can read the verses. I love it. Pray for each other. Because the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power. You're awake now. It has great power. Your prayers have power. Your prayers have power. They're powerful. And they produce. When we break this verse down, that, that word earnest is where we get the word energy. It's the Greek word energeo. The earnest prayer, the energetic, passionate prayer. Elijah's prayers were not anemic little whispers of doubt. They had power behind them, energy, passion, because he was committed to the Lord, he believed the word of God was true, that God was always faithful, and he could count on it every time. So when he prayed, it wasn't, oh, check God, I just, if it's your will, would you please? It was like, God, let's do this thing. You said it. You said it. Let's do it. Whatever I got to do, you tell me, I'm walking it out. Let's do it together. God, you... You want to send rain? Okay, let's send it. We're here. And we ain't moving until you send the rain. That's an energetic prayer. That's a prayer with energy, with power behind it. Fervent. No drive-by prayers. What's a drive-by prayer? Dear God, thank you for the food. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear God, help me sleep tonight. It would be great if I had a good day tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Those are drive-by prayers. His prayers had energy. His prayers had passion. They weren't half-hearted. They were intentional. They were the kind of prayers that didn't give up until the manifestation of God's word came true. It's not just energetic prayers. It's a prayer from a righteous person. By show of hands, how many of you in here feel righteous? Anybody? You feel righteous? If you raise your hand, we have a different sermon topic. Because we all have sin. And we've all fallen short. And the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. But here's the beauty of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, all of our sin, for all time, was deleted off the record. And we receive not our righteousness, but his righteousness. So we're righteous because he's righteous, because he lives in us. So it's not self-righteousness, it's divine righteousness. So you're not righteous because you feel it. You're righteous because he's righteous and he lives in you. So the powerful prayer of a righteous person does what? It has powerful results. It wields power. The word means to wield power. So think about it. We break it down because we miss it when we don't meditate on it. Your energetic prayer, because of who you are, wields the power of God. Now do you know why the enemy is trying to stop you? Now do you know why the enemy wants you not to pray, especially out loud in a group of other believers who are righteous and powerful in the presence of God? Why he doesn't want you at home declaring the promises of God or, or uh, declaring them over your kids or constantly speaking the word? He wants you to feel not good enough, not capable, like you don't know what to say. He wants you to feel embarrassed, awkward, and shy because if he can silence you, he can stop you. Your energetic prayers wield power to do what? To produce wonderful results. That word means many, large, much, or abundant. Your prayers don't do just a little bit. 
You see, we have in this culture, we have this mindset when tragedies happen, when somebody's going through a hard time, they lose a loved one, or there's something national that happens, we often use this phrase. We say, our thoughts and our prayers are with you. And people also say, well, I believe prayer works. I believe prayer works. That's quaint, but it totally undersells what God is telling the church of Jesus Christ. Thoughts and prayers are not the same as energetic, powerful prayers of the righteous. Because the powerful, energetic prayers of the righteous, they don't accomplish a little. They do abundant things. Because our God is a God of abundance. He's an exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we can ask or think type of a God. He's a above and beyond type of God. Your prayers don't do a little, beloved. Your prayers do a lot. You need to retrain your mind. That your heart will come into agreement with the truth of God's word. Your prayer. Somebody say, my prayer is powerful and produces abundantly. My prayer is powerful and produces abundantly your prayer. Don't lean on your neighbor's prayer, though we benefit from it. Your prayer. Your prayer. Your prayer. All it takes, beloved, and we quote this verse a lot, is 11, Hebrews 11, 1, 6. It says, it's impossible to please God without faith. But anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. I always think, why does it say they must believe that he exists? It doesn't say those who believe a God exists. Because there are many people who think there's a God out there. There's a power out there. Anyone who wants to go to God must believe he exists. Him. Alpha. Omega. Beginning and the end. The bright and morning star. The ancient of days. The first and the last. The one and true God, Yahweh. Manifest in Christ, the Son, who lived through the power of the Spirit. This is the God that we must believe in. And when we believe in this God, we believe also in who he is, which is the character of faithfulness and love and might and power and justice and righteousness. So we believe that he exists. And what does he do? He rewards. Somebody say rewards. Those who diligently and sincerely seek him. He rewards. How does he do it? With answered prayer. That God we worship, that God we serve, rewards those who seek him diligently with answered prayer. That word diligently means to search for, investigate, beg, or crave. It's an all or nothing. It's a relentless pursuit. It's like a kid begging for candy at the checkout line. Doesn't that drive you crazy? If you're a parent in here or you've watched your siblings, kids, it's a hassle enough, stressful enough just to get through the store. Finally, we get to the checkout line, and it's like, oh, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost out of this. Can I have a piece of candy? Can I have a minute, maid? I'll pay you back. You don't got a job. I'll pay you back. It'll be with my own money. I promise I'll do something I have. No, you can't have that. There you go. You know, you just, you cave to get through it. But they ask over and over and over and over, and it gets on your nerves until either you have a meltdown in the checkout lane or you give them what they're asking for. And God is saying there is a reward for those who beg for an answer, who crave for the answer. Faith is what produces the diligent pursuit. No faith, no power. 
No faith, no power. God doesn't honor faithlessness. It's impossible to please him without faith. But he rewards those who diligently seek him. How are they dil diligently seeking him? They are trusting and believing in the God who is above all gods. Faith is the driver of the relentless pursuit. So we have to ask the question, what is faith? We talk about it all the time. What is it? Hebrews 11.1. 1, it's the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us an assurance about things we cannot see. Another translation says the faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. Faith is not an idea. Faith is tangible. It's the result. It is the, the confidence that what God said is true and we believe it with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because it changes how we live and believe, how we speak. So faith is what is produced in a life that is committed, who trusts in Almighty God. It's the byproduct of a life that is fully convinced that God is faithful and that his word is true. It, it's not something that I go buy at the store and say, I've got faith. It's a result of you trusting God and living like you believe him. That's faith. So God exists, the God exists, this is who he is, I can believe that he's true, my prayers are based on the promises that he's declared, and I can stand on it, and my life will reflect it, because I'm not deviating from that reality. That's a life of faith. And that's the kind of faith that pulls fire down from heaven. And that's the kind of faith that can calm a storm. And that's the kind of faith that can walk on the water in the midst of chaos. And that's the kind of faith that can lay hands on the sick and see them healed. And that's the kind of faith that can speak what God is speaking to them and see a prophetic word change somebody's life for the rest of their life. And that's the kind of faith that God is calling us into. Faith is what is witnessed when believers trust and obey God. Faith manifests in action. This is why James also in his book says, some people say they have faith, and others say they have works, but I'm not going to tell you I have faith. I'm going to show you by the way I live. I'm going to show you what faith looks like. You can't read about it, but you can see it. You can see it in a life that is all in with Jesus. Elijah had great faith because he made a decision a long time ago that he would trust God no matter what, no matter the circumstances. No matter what peril he was in, he would trust the Lord. And that trust is what compelled him to move every time God said to move. Move to the comfort zone. Move to the place of refining. Move to the confrontation and the showdown. And now move into the blessing of the rain. And many lives were changed through the powerful things that he did. And I am fully convinced, beloved, that God wants to do the same things in you. He wants to minister to your brokenness in that place of comfort. Jesus wants to comfort you. But he also wants to take you out of your comfort zone into a place of refining. To mold you into who he's created you to be. And then he's going to pitch you against enemies so his power can be released in your life. So that you can change not only people that you know, but I believe so the church can change nations. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to do all the things I commanded you to do. It's not just a story we tell. It's a life we live. And it's a life God is calling the whole world into. Elijah had great courage, and I want to encourage you today that Elijah found the courage to walk in faith, his fearless commitment, in the place of worship. He found it in the presence of the Lord. He knew how to access the presence of God, 
and he became so aware with that reality, he understood that God was with him wherever he went. No matter where he was, he could turn that into a place of worship, connection, and communion with God. And whenever he needed God, he knew how to come before the Lord to ask him to work on his behalf. Because everywhere he went, he was standing on holy ground. And everywhere you go is holy ground. Everywhere you are is holy ground because of who is with you. And for many of us, we want to walk in faith like Elijah. We're just scared. And we just can't seem to bring ourselves to take steps of faith. If you want great faith today, beloved, then I would encourage you to become a great worshiper. If you want great faith, you want to walk in the power of God, you want to be confident in what he says, then become a great worshiper. Because before you can come to him, you have to believe who he is. You have to know who he is. And how do we get to know who our God is? By encountering his presence, by tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. And we do that in a place of praise, in a place of intimacy, a place of worship. The more you encounter him, the more you'll love him. He's irresistible. Our God is irresistible. The one who defines love itself. When you encounter him, you want more of him. Because there's nothing like it. We, we have these ideas about God, but then when we encounter him, we realize, oh, He's so much better. And then we encounter him again and be like, oh, I thought, I thought I knew how good he was, but this was better than the last time. He keeps getting better and better because he's beyond what we could ask or think. And he's inviting us to experience him in the place of worship. And the more we love him, the more we've encountered him, the more we love him, the more we love him, the more we will trust him. The more we trust him, the more faith will be evident in our lives and the more power of God we will see and experience. It's a chain reaction. And I believe there are many people who live spiritual droughts. They're, they're like the, the land that was in famine and drought. It hadn't rained in three days or three years. People are still waiting on the rain because they've yet to tap in to the reservoir of God's presence that you can tap into every time you gather for worship. Every time you get alone with God to seek Him in the secret place, you can tap into the reservoir of God's presence and be filled with living water, that place of intimacy where your heart begins to be knit with His. Your heart begins to beat with His. And the more you begin to hear his voice and know his voice and know his presence and to be comforted in his presence, it's in that place that we're able to call down the rain and be comforted in his presence. That place of worship. And the more we experience God for ourselves, the more we'll be excited for other people to experience him. Because we'll wake up to the reality to know they desperately need this. Their life's a mess. They're making every wrong decision after the next. It's not because they're choosing it. It's because they don't know. How many of us really knew the love of God until we encountered it for the first time? You just don't know. You don't know God is better. Because you've never experienced it. But when you experience the presence of God, you experience his love in your life, you wake up to a whole new reality. It's why it's called being born again. You're not the same after you're touched by God. And God has invited us all to that place of intimacy, to drink from the reservoir of living water. Revelation 21.6 Jesus is saying, it is finished. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. 
Is your life a spiritual drought? Do you feel disconnected from God? You need God to move in a powerful way, but you're in that place where you're just like, I just don't know. I just don't understand. I don't even know if God hears me when I call out, beloved. Jesus is offering you a drink of living water so that that drought becomes a wellspring of life, and he wants you to find it in the place of worship. Begin in that place of worship where you lay your dignity on the altar. You set it on fire and say, God, whatever I got to do, I'm going to do. I'm going to press in because I believe you are. I believe you reward. I'm going to go after it until it happens. I'm going to stand like Elijah. I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to keep pressing in until the fire falls and the rain comes and washes all the muck away. God, I'm coming in Jesus' name. This is the altar call. Beloved, do you want God to move in your life? Do you want God to move in our worship gathering? And then it begins with a heart of worship. Connecting our hearts to the Lord. And so let's stand. And let's bow for prayer in this place. And let's respond. This is the, this is the invitation. Seek God. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. If you need to come forward and you want to kneel down at these chairs and pray, you come right now. Don't wait. We'll have some prayer team members down here. We'll have some people down here praying. As we worship, you seek the Lord. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing every time, over and over again, and expecting different results. You can keep getting the same result. All you got to do is keep doing the same thing. But God's inviting you into something more. So I'm encouraging you to do something you've never done before. Maybe you need to be like Elijah. Get down on your hands and knees. Put your face between your knees. And press into the presence of God. Maybe you need to lift your hands for the first time. Extending yourself as you seek God. Maybe you need to sing out loud or pray out loud. Whatever God is laying on your heart, do it as we worship him and give him praise. And we'll rejoice together. If you're the one that was supposed to give the testimony and you didn't give it, Chris or Scott will be down here. I knew it. I felt it back there. Somebody was supposed to share today. Becky's coming down. We'll let her give the testimony, and then Tony will begin leading us. If you guys could help her with the microphone. If you need a prayer for healing, come on down and let our prayer team pray with you. As we follow what God is leading. And we're going to let the Spirit continue His work in this place.